Uh, thank you very, very much for joining me today for open source licensing, types, strategies, and compliance. My name is Jeff Lush. Uh, this is going to be a two uh, period session. First one lasting about 45 minutes. We're gonna have a 15 minute break and then rejoin at the top of the hour for the last 45 minutes. Uh, my name, as I said, is Jeff Lush. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Jeff Lush, and I have a website that you can uh, contact me via email at, uh, which is zebracatzebra.com. So please feel free to contact me about any of the topics today. And we also will have a chat window. So toward the end of the first session, we'll answer any questions that people may have. And if there's any problems with the audio or slides, please let us know. I have my colleague, Stacy Potter will be joining and we'll try to answer anything in the chat window as it comes up. And uh, let's get going. So a little bit about myself. My, as I said too many times, my name is Jeff Lush. I founded a, pal a company called Palomita back in 2004, which was one of the first scanning tools to manage open source. I've designed a compliance audit program and built out a professional services team to implement that program. And that team has helped everyone handle basic compliance, M&A due diligence, open source project hygiene, and other things involving open source licensing and security. And I've worked with sole proprietors in open source projects all the way up to the largest companies in the world. And I've seen the industry move back in the early 2000s from using maybe a couple dozen open source projects to now using thousands and thousands of thousands of packages in a typical application. So today in the two sessions, we're gonna go over a couple things related to open source licensing, security, and compliance. In the first block, we're going to go over open source licenses. Why do we have them? A little bit about the history of them, what types of licenses exist, as well as the obligations that you might see. We'll then move into compliance and talk about notices, what others are doing, how business models affect licensing, how M&A and open source releases May affect licensing and some hot topics that are coming up in the licensing world. In our second half, we'll move to security, talk about vulnerabilities and how to fix them, what customers expect, and some tools and scanners that can help manage. And then lastly, we'll go more into best practices. So working with suppliers, how do you become compliant? How do you manage education, remediation? A little more on scanning tools and the pluses and minuses there and some thoughts about the future. So the big question of the day, why do we need open source licenses? Well, the main reason is because we live in a society where copyright law exists. So copyright is how authors, how people who create content, whether it's movies, music, or software, control their work. We have given the people who create things, who create content, the, the basically a legal framework to decide who gets to use their work. And you need explicit permission in order to use someone else's work. And the way that we have decided to give other people's permission is through a license or a contract. And all of us have probably managed uh, commercial licenses. If you've gone out and purchased an app on your phone, if you have purchased an office product, if you've purchased a game for your video game system, you have purchased a commercial license to a piece of software. Open source licenses are the same thing. It's the way we give permission. No money is exchanged. Open source by its very definition is free, but there has been a trade of obligations. So the open source author doesn't have to hang out on the telephone and answer every question about, can I use it? Can I use it? Can I use it? They basically have said, if you follow this list of obligations, you get to use my software. You get to use my library. If you don't, if you don't follow my obligations, you don't get to use this, this piece of software, this, this library. So uh, a license is a legal agreement, and it may be difficult to understand. There are millions and millions of lawyers in the world who every day look at contracts and look at agreements and try to figure out what they mean. And typically, we want to spend more time writing software and building software than reading legal agreements. And so what we've kind of decided on as an industry is that we have a few common legal agreements, we call those open source licenses or other licenses that make reuse easier. We don't wanna to have to 
negotiate or understand a new license each and every time we download a, a software library. So we picked a few, the community has kind of picked a few licenses that are the common open source licenses to make reuse easier. And we'll talk about what those look like today. So I talked about how there are obligations. So different licenses have different types of obligations. You can imagine that you could have a contract that is four lines long. You might have a license that is four lines long, or you might have a contract that is dozens of pages or hundreds of pages or thousands of pages long. You can imagine if you're buying a company, you might sign a contract that's a couple hundred pages long. If you're using a small piece of JavaScript, you, you don't want a license that, that is that long. So you might want to pick something that's a little shorter, a little easier to understand, and maybe doesn't have as many obligations. So there is a spectrum. There's an ecosystem of licenses out there. Some of them have almost no obligations whatsoever. They're just a, a legal framework to say, I wrote this. You can use it. Um, you don't have to do anything. Uh, there may be just a disclaimer. Hey, I wrote this. I don't want to get sued. I put this out there into the open source world, but I, I really don't want to lose my house because you used my software and decided that you should sue me. So on the lower end of the spectrum, there's, there's some disclaimers and, and warranties. Um, there may just be notices. What that means is, please keep my copyright statement in the code that I wrote. Don't, don't strip my, my copyright or my other notices or my licenses. Please give credit where credit is due. And then we move into some of the, what, what we might consider stronger obligations or, or uh, some people say this gives you more freedom. Some people say this gives you less freedom, but the idea of copyleft which means if you use this software that I give you, the software library, um, I expect you to give some or all of your source code away if you give people this product or if you, in some cases, give access to it over the internet. And that's what we call copyleft. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in later slides. And there also may be some restrictions around business models. Not all of these are open source obligations. Some of these are just obligations and restrictions that we see in the licensing world but there may be a business model restriction. Maybe you're very concerned about nuclear power plants and the danger of what might happen if your software fails. We'll, we'll see in some cases some restrictions on airplane software, nuclear power plant software, or in some cases, some business models. Maybe people don't want you to compete with them and they've put some restrictions in their licensing. We'll talk about a little bit about that later on today. So a license may have one or more obligations, Typically, typically is going to have at least a disclaimer and a notices um, obligation, but there may be more. And some are obviously easier to comply with than others. If it's just a disclaimer, you say, you know, I'm not going to sue this person. If it's a notice obligation, you're going to provide those notices when you provide your software. Other things are a little more difficult. So there's a, a large series of obligations that are out there. Many of them may require some legal analysis especially if you are running a business or if you want to um, do some things that may be a little strange or different than what the open source world typically does. Uh, it is very important for you to go and get good legal advice. None of what I give you today is legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV or anything like that, but I've, I've worked a lot with engineering teams and legal teams and I've seen the things that have caused some concern between, between both of them and also the places that have been very difficult for each other to, to understand. One of the big obligations that we see in the commercial world is paying money, a commercial obligation. That's not an open source obligation by any means, but probably 10% of the software that you use has some sort of commercial agreement around it. May require money, may just be a click through EULA, but it is commercial, it's not open source. Uh, there may be some other licenses that say, uh, share your source code. As we talked about, that's copyleft. You may need to bundle some source code when you make a distribution, when you deliver your product to people. You're going to need to share credit, which means either give attribution or notices. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but you may see that in, in about boxes or documentations or on your web pages. We'll talk a little bit more about patents and restrictions around the use of patents. We talked a little bit about the restrictions on use. Um, if you are in government, military, or certain types of industries like nuclear power, aviation, automotive, you may want to look very closely at the licenses, both commercial and open source, and, and in between that you're signing up for. Those are industries that typically have restriction notices around field abuse. 
if you are a uh, application service provider and you want to uh, sell access to say certain types of databases, you may find restrictions on uh, your ability to do that in some of the new open source or quasi open source licenses that are out there. Talk again more about that later on in the day. You'll hear the term sometimes vanity license. This, uh, these are one off licenses, very, very typically written by the developer themselves. We saw this more in the early 90s and 2000s as when there was an explosion of open source licensing. Uh, but you still see them from day to day as, as people decide to make interesting and funny licenses. They typically, typically require some sort of non-traditional action. So one that we see from time to time is the free beer license that says, you know, buy me a beer if this helps me, helps you. Uh, don't do any evil. We see that in one of the famous JSON libraries that are out there. Uh, one of the early vanity licenses was a get vaccinated uh, license. And again, these, these are typically one-offs. You're not gonna see very many of them, but they, they surprisingly will take a lot of legal time to, de to decide whether they're good or bad in your, in your application. So when you are picking open source libraries, Try to stay away from vanity licenses or one-off licenses if you really can. And then lastly, you'll see the, the don't sue me disclaimer or as is lack of warranty uh, notice obligations. Basically it says the user can't sue the open source author. So these are the main obligations that we're going to see. There's many, many others. Some of the, the new licenses range for, from you know, a couple paragraphs to a few pages. That text is there for a reason. Those are obligations. Those are requirements for you, for you to understand before you use those libraries, before you use that software. So do look at each line in a license and make sure you understand it. So let's talk a little bit about the history of open source licenses. Open source really started in the mid 80s to early 90s. Uh, there's always been sharing of software. There's always been uh, you know, mag tape being sent through the mail, being driven to people, disks being sent through the mail, et cetera. But it really was in the mid 80s to early 90s where the computer industry decided that uh, we, need to, we need to share source code with some sort of agreement. Uh, there was, this was in the beginning of what we called the Unix wars. There was a lot of desktop workstations running Unix companies fighting, companies uh, building new applications, building new devices, and not really sharing the code. And the hobbyist community, the academic community, the, the people who are really interested in building new software products and, and, and sharing, got together and said, let's, let's make licenses. Let's make agreements that, that make it very clear what the obligations and expectations around sharing are. We'll talk a little bit about the philosophies there. But we really got our start in open source in the mid, mid 80s to early 90s. The licenses that appeared there, the X11 MIT, the BSD license, the general public license family, they are still with us. We, they, they got it right back in the early, early 80s and 90s for, for software that is distributed, for software that goes on a device or runs a program. Then in the 2000s, we, we saw there was a change. We moved from desktop workstations to more of the internet world. The, there was the dot-com boom. There was more sharing on the internet. There were more websites being created. There was more software available to be downloaded. There were, there were sharing sites explicitly for open source. And also there was more commercial interests. So we moved from licenses really coming from the, the kind of the community to licenses really being affected by commercial interests and companies. And you'll see that the licenses got longer. They had more legal texts, they had more legal folks involved, and they were really around addressing kind of the corporate interests of the internet age. And we'll talk a little bit now about 2020 toward the end of the slide deck about what's changing, what's changed since kind of the initial dot-com world. So let's talk about notices. These are one of the easier things to comply with, though ironically enough, most companies and most organizations are doing a really horrible job of complying with the most basic open source obligation, which is providing notices. So if, if you go read an open source license, and again, we'll do that in a little bit, 
many of them, if not all of them, require some sort of copyright, copyright statements to be preserved or the license text to be preserved and passed along to the end user. Um, this is sometimes called attribution, notices, uh, sometimes people call these permissive licenses. There's a lot of, of terminology around that. Uh, what do we want to call these things? But at, at the heart of it, they are giving credit where credit is due. Um, if somebody is complying with these licenses, you may find them in your about box or a legal info menu, or perhaps in the back of your documentation or the front of your documentation. And you hopefully will find them preserved in any source code that is in your uh, repository, whether it's for your developer's use or provided to your, to your customers or your users. The other side of the world is the copyleft or viral licenses. Uh, there, are, there is what we call the strong copyleft or the weak copyleft licenses. So the uh, Afero general public license, the regular general public license, the sleepy cat license, or the creative Commons share alike license are often used with stack overflow code samples. These are licenses that require sharing. So if you are using uh, and distributing a product that is, uh, has software under these licenses, the expectation is that you're going to be providing pretty much all of the source code for that product to your users or to your customers. And there are, there are kind of refinements of why and where that open source uh, sharing will go on. But in general, if you are using something under a strong copy left license, like these li licenses here, the expectation is that you're going to be giving a lot of source code away. There is a uh, slightly weaker version of these licenses. They call weak copy left. Uh, one that is very familiar to people is probably the lesser general public license, the LGPL, or the Eclipse public license, known as the EPL. Um, these are very, very common. And they also require sharing of code, but not as much as the strong copyleft licenses. The, the weak copyleft licenses are typically uh, restricted to the code inside the module itself, the library itself that you're using, and typically does not reach out into your application or code outside of that module itself. Term that you'll see in the obligations around copyleft is the corresponding source or the corresponding source code bundle. Uh, what this means is the code that you need to provide to your customers. So when you do use these, these libraries, these licensed libraries, and you need to share your code, either some or all of your code needs to be shared. And this is commonly through some sort of included source bundle. You'll sometimes hear the term tarball or source zip or a written offer to deliver that code at some later point. Um, you may provide a download link. So please click on this link to download the zip or tarball. But for some of the licenses, that's not sufficient. I would say for most people, that that's a great way to deliver your code. But under some of the licenses, you may need to uh, provide it through a different mechanism. And it is important that the corresponding source is provided in kind of a complete way. It does, doesn't mean the source code. It can mean for many of these licenses to include things like the build scripts, the make files, and other, other scripts that are required to build the application itself. It doesn't typically involve the tool chain, like your compiler and things like that, but the make files and other files like that that are used by those tools may be required to be passed along. There was a, a license that came out in um, first in the early 2000s and then updated in 2007 called the AGPL. And that was designed to close a loophole. So many of these, many of these libraries and licenses only come into effect when you share or distribute a software product. Uh, as we've moved to software as a service and cloud apps, uh, we're not distributing a classic program anymore. We're not delivering an XE or some sort of binary. And so new licenses appeared. The first one was called the Afero General Public License. And it, it was designed to close that loophole. So AGPL said, if you are um, building a software as a service product, and maybe you do some things, maybe you modify the code, the expectation is that you're going to give away and share all the source code to your total application. 
Um, that was not enough for some companies. And, and these are some non open source licenses that have appeared since then uh, that are that are not open source, though are very often mentioned in the same breath as open source licenses that try to also close what some people perceive it perceive as this loophole. The idea is that some people build and typically we see this in the database world, these these great databases, these amazing open source databases. And then other companies have come in, typically cloud providers, and are taking those open source databases and selling access to running instances of those databases and making a lot of money. And the original products looked at that and said, well, we're not making any money off of this. We see these cloud providers coming in. How do we stop them from just you know, trivially hosting our software and making money? And what we've seen in the, the last few years is some, some new licenses. They're not open source, but again, mentioned in the same breath as open source, that try to close, again, what's perceived as a loophole. Um, some terms and, and, and license names that you may hear are the commons clause, the server side public license, and other similar licenses that put restrictions on the business case, such as hosting builds of the original software. Um, you often will see these around what's called open core projects. So cases where the core database say is open sourced, but a lot of tools that are used to run and manage that open source project, maybe are put under a proprietary license or a commercial license. So keep an eye out for those. If you are in the uh, business of, of hosting applications or databases, this may be something that's uh, very pertinent to you. Or if you're somebody who is using a hosted database or um, is building a database into your product, you should be aware of these, these new licenses and concerns. Because I think in the database space, we're gonna see a lot of churn in licensing. We're gonna see a lot of churn in how people manage and host these, these databases and applications as people try to figure out a business model around them. So let's, let's walk through a license. Um, I've picked a short license here. This is the uh, BSD license. This is one of the earliest open source licenses. This is a, a slightly different version of the license, a little, little newer, but not, not that new. Um, it fits on a single PowerPoint slide. Uh, that's, that's sometimes a sign of a, of a great license that you can, you can read it in an email. You can almost fit this in a tweet. Uh, so let's walk through this license. And again, this is not legal advice, but it, it's something that I find helpful as we look at these licenses and try to understand them. So I've, I've colored uh, the license sentences here in a rainbow of colors. I've also put an arrow next to it if you, if you have trouble seeing the colors here. And let's walk through each line one by one to understand this license. So the first line that we see is the copyright statement. So when we talk about notices, when we talk about attribution, very often it, that is the line right there. And it might say copyright 2020, Jeff Lush. It might say copyright 2020, the name of an open source project. That is often the uh, copyright statement that you see in about boxes. It's often what is showing up in documentation and it is an extremely important thing to preserve. One of the worst things that you can do as a developer is to remove a copyright statement from some code. The, the next line here is a redistribution and use permission. For, for something to be open source, you need to have the ability to use it and redistribute it. And you typically want to be able to do that in both source code and binary forms with and without modification. That's an important thing to, to know. It's an important thing to see. And then here's the, the, the kind of the, the important clause that says, provided the following conditions are met. So this is where those obligations get shown to us. So the author is saying, great, I'm glad you love my software. You can use it. You can do all these things with it as long as you do the following. And in, what I like about the BSD is there's a nice numbered list of the things that the author wants you to do. Number one, if you distribute the source code, you must retain the above copyright notice, this list of conditions and the following disclaimer. So basically saying, if you use my software and you give away the source code, don't strip my information, give credit where credit's due, keep this license in the text so that your users know what their permissions are and obligations are, and they know what code is being used. Number two, if you're distributing this in binary form, 
You also must reproduce the above copyright notice, this list of conditions and the following disclaimer in the documentation and or materials provided with the distribution. So if you make an executable, if you make an app, put it on an app store, somebody downloads it, expectation is that that copyright statement and this license and the disclaimer gets passed on to the user. Number three, uh, neither the name of the copyright holder or the names of the contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from the software without specific prior written permission. This was called a non-endorsement clause. This basically says, please don't tell people that I love your software. You know, I, I just made you an open source library. I, I'm not telling you, uh, I'm not telling people that your code is great, or you shouldn't say my code is great because I use Jeff's library. That, that is something that uh, they just want to provide the source code, they want to provide the library, and they don't want to be involved with your marketing at all. And then lastly, there's the disclaimer. Very often in all capital letters, nice big block of text, a wall of text, that basically says, I'm giving you this code as is, please don't sue me, not even please don't sue me, you can't sue me, uh, I just gave you the code, it's your job to make everything work. So this is a, a really interesting uh, license that shows a lot of the things that we, we pay attention to around obligations. You notice that it doesn't talk about sharing the source code. You notice that it doesn't talk about business models. You know, that it doesn't talk about money at all. Those are all things that are either part of commercial licenses or different types of open source licenses. Okay. Another thing that may be interesting to you is around patents. So patents and software patents in particular are a very hot button topic for people. There, there are some people who don't believe that software should be uh, under the patent law at all. There's other companies who have made thousands and thousands of software patents and use their patent portfolios to either um, you know, keep competitors out of their space or make licensing money and things like that. So patents are definitely a concern. Uh, if you are working in certain industries where, where patents are, are often used in the software world, or you're using features that um, often are patent encumbered, so but patents are very commonly uh, kind of associated with things such as uh, video uh, compression, audio compression. If you are building an application that moves video around the internet or audio around the internet, or doing certain things involving with fonts, or sometimes uh, uh, disk, uh, disk compression or disk media formats. These are all things that patents have been associated with in recent memory. So when you, if you, if you are in those industries or if you're using libraries that provide functionality like that, um, especially if you're in the hardware space, uh, these are things that, that might make the patent issues kind of rise up a little higher than if you maybe are not in those industries. Certain licenses imply patent permissions, basically saying, um, if you are providing code to the open source project, the assumption is that you're also providing a license to use any patents that's associated with that code. Uh, the open source projects don't want people to give a bunch of code, get it out into the people, people's hands, and then that original contributor to come out and say, aha, you owe us all this money now because you're, you're using code that, that um, infringes on our patent. So licenses like the Apache 2.0 and the Mozilla 2.0 license basically say, if you give our project code, there's, there's a kind of an implied license grant around the patents. You know, we, if you give us code, do not come out later and expect that you're going to be able to sue people for using patents associated with that code. So that, that provides a protection to the projects as well as people who are using the, those projects. Um, others, again, the Apache 2.0 and Mozilla license um, are good examples here, also say, if, if you are using our code and you go out to other people and sue them for patents, uh, patent infringement, you, you will lose your right to, to use this open source library. That's called a, a retaliation, a patent retaliation clause. Uh, basically, the license terminates for that open source project if you find yourself um, in that in that world where you're going out and uh, kind of enforcing patents on people who are using the software and you happen to use the software as well. Again, it's, it's more complicated than that is especially this is a topic that is especially important to have your 
your legal staff weigh in on. But um, do pay attention to these clauses, especially if your company has patents or is in a space where there may be patent encumbered libraries or functionality. And I, I, can't repeat, I can't repeat it enough. If you're doing anything with audio or video, your developers are doing anything with compression, it's extremely important. I can't tell you how many companies I've seen um, really get in trouble and have a lot of fixing um, of their products because of audio and video um, licensing problems around patents. So another thing that you'll see is dual licensing. Uh, what this means is the open source library they want to use is available under multiple licenses. It may be under a open source license or a commercial license. And what's, what's great about copyright law, or what's interesting about copyright law is, it gives you as the author the ability to sell the same software or distribute the same software to different people under different terms. Uh, you might have seen this in the commercial space where students uh, can buy um, office packages for pennies on the dollar. But if you're a corporation and you want to buy pretty much that same package, you're going to pay the full price. The original author there gets to choose how they want to license and, and distribute their product. Open source authors have those same permissions. And you very often you'll see them provide two or three different licenses for the same library. And there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, the main reason that we see dual licensing happening in 2020 is really as a business model forcing function. What you'll see is that the original project will pick what may be seen as a scary license, maybe a license that has a lot of copy left uh, terms in it. So maybe something like a GPL license or more and more these days, the Afero GPL license. Commercial companies typically stay away from GPL and AGPL for products that they're going to distribute um, or host. Um, or they'll pick the friendly license, a commercial license. Just pay us some money and you don't have to worry about open source licensing or copyleft at all. And very common as a business model forcing function, uh, it's important for your developers to understand that just because something's open source, that doesn't mean that it may be perfect for your company just to use. They should be very aware of the copyleft implications, they should be very aware of their distribution model. I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. And if you do see A versus B, so license A versus commercial, your, your assumption should be that that first license is something that's going to have a lot of copyleft obligations typically. Number two, and we, we don't see this as much, though you will definitely see this in, in legacy code, is dual licensing to make it clear that different communities can use a library. So in the older code, you might see something where it says, this code is licensed under GPL or MIT, or MPL, GPL, or LGPL licenses. Uh, that was very common when there was a community that had one license and really wanted to use a different library. And so that library's organization said, you know, we'll make it clear that people can use it under our preferred license or the license of this other library as well, so GPL or MIT. Most organizations would probably typically you know, want to use that under an MIT license if they had a choice, with fewer obligations, fewer things to keep track of. And mostly that was to make sure that licensing was compatible between the different libraries that might be combined. You see that less and less these days, though um, I think it won't be a surprise to see those packages live on for decades um, as some subcomponents to things you've already decided to use. So a couple more examples that almost certainly you are using right now in your, in your products. MySQL is licensed under a GPL v2 license or a commercial license. Uh, MongoDB, another database under a server side public license, which is not open source, though is, is adjacent to the open source world or a commercial license. iText was a GPL or commercial. Wolf SSL, which is an encryption library, GPL or commercial. Those are all the, the, in some ways, the business model forcing function style dual licensing. A very strong copyleft license on the left hand side or copyleft style license on the left hand side or a um, commercial license on the right hand side. And then if you look at jQuery, older versions in particular, they were licensed under GPL or MIT. That was so that the uh, jQuery library could be used 
I think uh, in various other li um, libraries without any concern about license compatibility, those questions have pretty much gone away. And now jQuery is assumed under the MIT license. So let's talk about license versions. So as time goes on, open source licenses get updated. Um, there may be a court case. There may be refinements based on uh, use in the field. There may be some um, new business model changes that the licenses want to update or some creaky corners or corner cases that they want to make it very clear uh, what the license really means. And so as time goes on, licenses change. And sometimes the licenses change and they're denoted with a version number. So the general public license had a version one, version two, version three. Apache license went from version one to one one to two zero. Um, the BSD license did not change its version number, but changed the number of clauses, the numbered clauses that we saw in that license before. Went from a four clause to a three clause to a two clause to a one clause, in some cases zero clauses. So these are all things to, to pay attention to. Just because somebody says it's a GPL license, you may have multiple versions of that license to understand. The BSD might have three, four versions. Uh, you need to understand how many clauses that you may need to respect. And some licenses have many variants, but no differences whatsoever in their names. Very common example of this is the MIT license. It has at least 23 variants, no difference whatsoever. People just say, oh, it's an MIT license. Uh, Fedora Project has a great listing of the 23 variants of the MIT license that they have seen. And as you remember, the MIT license was one of the earliest open source licenses out there, started in around 1985. It's had now decades to basically spread through the open source community and get tweaked here and there, things added, words changed, words removed, and so on and so on. Uh, what's nice is the MIT license is typically a pretty, pretty uh, permissive license. But if you haven't read it and you're not familiar with every word in that license, you, you may get um, surprised by the things that you find in it. So why, when do I need to care? Um, in the old world, people shipped software. You got a, you downloaded it or it came on a disk. Maybe it came on a device. That is what we call distribution. It means that the original author has provided maybe the binary, maybe an executable, and has given it to you through some means. Um, and many of the open source licenses that we've talked about today only come into effect when the code is distributed. So if you're doing software as a service, you typically don't need to care about the MIT, the BSD, even the GPL uh, library license for, for the code that you're using. Um, if you are making an app, if you're making uh, maybe a device or an application that people are going to download, you very, very much have to pay attention to the, the licenses that go inside of it. And so when you look at your business model, when you look at your distribution model, um, that really affects your policies. What do you allow? What don't you allow? What do you manage? What don't you manage? So very important to understand. And it's one of the core questions that companies have to struggle with when they're looking at licenses and the policies. And they're not clear cut. Distribution used to be easy. We always distributed. Now, um, there's sometimes some gray areas or your business model changes overnight. So if you're using something for internal use, that's not tr traditionally seen as a distribution. You may not need to care about your open source licensing. If you give something distributed to the uh, end user as a binary, most definitely is a distribution. Maybe you build something into a container. Well, if the container is running on your servers, that's not a distribution. If it gets pushed to your customer's machines, that is a distribution. Um, software as a service, if it's all in your machines, not a distribution. If it's pushed to the cloud, maybe that Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud Platform still, still run by you, maybe not be seen as a distribution. But what happens sometimes is marquee customers say, we want a private cloud version. And you suddenly have to push that to their devices. That might be seen as a distribution and all those licenses come into effect. So you have to pay attention to distribution model and you need to understand how your model may change with time. Um, what may be software as a service today may be become a push to a, a device at a customer tomorrow. And it is at that point almost too late to get your open source house in order and your commercial code house in order if it comes after a sale or a contract change. <laughs>
Um, so what looks like open source, but isn't? So we've talked a lot about open source licensing today. We've talked about some things that are not like commercial, some of the new licenses like the server side or the commons clause, which are not seen as open source licenses. But there is a big spectrum of licenses or quasi licenses that you are going to see when you're dealing with a real product. So people often use the shorthand saying, oh, let's talk about open source licensing or open source license compliance. Uh, it's not a great term because in general, it's really license compliance. We're going to talk probably 80% of what we're going to deal with is open source, but 20, 25, 30% of it is going to be not open source, but something that definitely has to be complied with. So you're hey, going Jeff. to know that. Hey, hey Jeff, yes. just wanted to give you a heads up. Sorry for interrupting, but we have five minutes left. Okay, perfect. So I'll finish the slide and then we'll go to some questions. So what looks like open source, but isn't? Uh, number one, code marked for non-commercial use, also known as NC. Uh, we see this very often. People are very concerned about getting either sued or they, they don't want companies using it for some reason. Uh, and they mark it as for non-commercial use only. You often see this in some of the Creative Commons style licenses. The definition of commercial use is, is hard to define, but in general, if you're doing this for work, it's probably commercial use. You probably can't use that. Um, freeware or click-through EULAs, those are a commercial license. They, they may not require payment, but they require some sort of agreement. And you may want to understand what you click through. Everybody always clicks, always accept. But if you're doing this for commercial purposes, you probably want to know what's in that agreement and save that agreement away. Uh, the one-off licenses, like the vanity licenses we talked about before, you may find yourself buying beer for a lot of people or, or getting vaccinated. Uh, understand what your, what your terms are there. Sometimes you just see all rights reserved. Um, that doesn't give you permission to use it. That's basically saying, I, I own the copyright for this and I haven't told you what the terms are, the obligations are. You need to follow up on that and get permission. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean you have permission to use it. And same with, with no declared license. It's very common to go to GitHub, find the source code, be able to down the source code, but if you have permission to use it, if there's not a license there or there's not an author statement saying what the permissions are, you're not allowed to use it. You might have visible source, but it doesn't mean you have um, permission to use it. And um, let me, um, let's go to questions right now. And then at the top of the hour, we'll continue with the, with the deck here. So if there's any questions, uh, please uh, chat, uh, type them into the chat. And uh, or I believe we also can do audio if people feel more comfortable doing audio and we'll answer any questions right now. So I think if we don't have any questions, I'll go for one or two more minutes here. We'll then have a break, go get a drink, get a sandwich. Oh, and um, okay, we have one question here from Tyler Atwood. Um, and I'll read this for everybody if everybody can't see it. Can short software snippets taken from help sites such as Stack Overflow be used with a simple attribution or is there a standard procedure there? Um, I'll talk more about this in the second half. Of, of today's uh, session. We'll talk about snippets and cutting and pasting. But the um, um, short answer for, for Tyler's question there about uh, uh, snippets and Stack Overflow, all snippets, for the most part, are going to have some license. It may not be clear what the license is, but since somebody else wrote it, you, especially for commercial purposes, you're going to want to have um, explicit permission. You probably want to have something written down for the future about what the permission is there. Um, for Stack Overflow, it's a very complicated situation. If you go look at the Stack Overflow site, and they've, they've changed this back and forth over the years, and we should double check what it is right now, but I believe the, the, the source code that is provided on Stack Overflow is currently a Creative Commons share alike license, which uh, we mentioned before on one of the earlier slides is a strong copy left license, meaning if you use it, the expectation is you're going to share the code to the um, um, to the statement there. And um, that's usually a problem. I've seen companies spend lots of hours, lots of days trying to deal with the Stack Overflow licensing question. Um, I think Stack Overflow picked that license to try to protect their site from being 
um, copied willy nilly by competing sites, but it is a is a very difficult license for for organizations and companies that deal with um, because they typically don't want to use a share alike license for source code. Okay. Um, so, and we'll talk more about that in the second half. Um, another, another question here from Sean McKinney is what's the difference between a license and a copyright? So a copyright is, um, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but this is, this is my understanding here. Um, in many, if not, you know, many countries, as soon as I put pen to paper and I build something, I create something, some sort of work, Maybe it's a story, maybe it's audio, a song, a movie, source code, a drawing. I have the copyright. That means I own the ability to decide how what I created is used in the future. So that's, that's copyright, the kind of the ownership of the work that you produced, you know, text, audio, software, pictures, et cetera. Um, a license is a common agreement or an agreement that the author picked to make it clear what the what the default permissions are to use it. So instead of having to answer an email every day or pick up the phone and say, yes, you have permission, no, you don't have permission, they use something which is called a license that gives permission to others to use their copywritten work and show, uh, kind of shows the obligations. What do you need to do in order to um, legally use that work? So preserve the notices, share the source code, um, don't sue me. Those are all the obligations that may show up in the license for that copyright work. So that's a great, great question. Thank you there, Sean. Okay. Um, and so um, Alexi Nikodin says, Jeff, does it make any sense to change the original files with dual license, say GPL or MIT, and limit the header to the license that we would like to use in our distribution. For example, the limit to MIT only. And we'll talk a little bit more about those best practices in the second half of the session today. Um, I see companies do, do a couple things. I, I see in some cases where they do change that license text. Um, in the dual license case, you may have the ability to do that. Um, what happens there though, is it sometimes gets a little hard to manage where you changed it, where you didn't change it. What I do see more commonly is um, organizations will, will keep that license text the same, but they'll explicitly either add a note above it or elsewhere that says for library A, which is available under GPL or MIT, we explicitly pick the MIT license. Um, so that's one, one thing that companies will, will do. Sometimes they'll just, if you have too many of them, they'll just, um, just let them be and just assume that they're picking the right thing. I'm a big fan of explicitly make, you know, uh, as someone I know says, uh, specific is terrific. I, I like, I like when organizations explicit specifically um, say what licensing they're using. Okay. Um, I see from Brittany Bell, any recommended resources uh, reading or uh, reading for small projects or small businesses that do not have the resources to hire a lawyer who specializes in software licenses. Um, come in the second half of the, the session today, so in about 10 minutes, we'll go through some resources and some recommendations there. So great, great um, participation there. So thanks so much for that. And so Brittany, stay, stick around for the second half. And I think, let's see if there's anything um, we should deal with. Um, how about we leave that here for now. Um, we'll rejoin in um, a couple minutes here at the top of the hour, and we'll finish with the um, with the session today. We'll, we'll talk a lot about it, about the best practices for organizations. So we're going to move from the specific licensing to compliance and remediation, which means fixing, talk about security, and some of the resources that might exist for organizations to learn more about this and to train their developers. So keep up with the questions. These questions really help. Uh, so uh, keep them keep them coming. And let's rejoin on the, the stay, keep this session open for 10 minutes, and we'll rejoin and have the second half of the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending today and see you in 10. Thank you guys. And as Jeff mentioned, we will reconvene back at two o'clock today. Thank you. I'm sorry, at three o'clock at the top of the hour, three o'clock. If you are just joining us right now uh, and you didn't see the first half, I promise you that you'll be able to uh, 
join us in motion here and it should hopefully all make sense. So if you're just joining us uh, fresh, uh, this is open source licensing, types, strategies, and compliance. My name is Jeff Lush, and you can reach me either through Twitter or through my website there. I'm gonna skip my, my intro here. I think most of you heard that already. And we will continue with our discussion about compliance, security, and best practices. And we have about 45 minutes today to uh, complete this session and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get through that. And we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. So we spent the first session talking about open source licensing, uh, talked about contracts, talked about copyrights. I think it's important to talk about the public domain. Um, this is a phrase that you will see and hear all over the place. And it is often used as magic words. I, I can't tell you how many developers have used the term public domain when they really mean open source, or they really mean, I just want to use it. I don't, I got it on the internet, it's public domain. It, it has a very, very specific legal definition, but it also has kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a, a folklore definition, especially around open source. So if you hear the term public domain, if you see the words public domain written down or developer says, yes, we can use this library, it's public domain, I would spend some extra time and you, what you want to do is you want to see explicit uh, written evidence that it truly is public domain. So the idea of public domain is there's no license, there's no copyright, do whatever you want with it. Uh, that is true. There are certain things that are, have either been released into the public domain or are so old that they don't have copyright associated with them anymore. But with, with the changes in copyright law, Copyright lasts for a long time, and it's it's hard to find code that is that is not under copyright or has not explicitly been released into copyright um, into the public domain. So definitely pay attention to it and, and watch out for scary things. So the phrase here, this code is licensed to the public domain under the GPL license. Um, that is just a horror show of a sentence. Uh, public domain says there's no copyright. The, the GPL license requires copyright to work. You 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 don't want to see people mixing those terms. Uh, that is a case where the person is trying to use public domain to mean open source. So pay attention to that, be very wary around public domain. And um, some countries don't recognize the public domain. You, you can't put something into the public domain in some countries. And what you see more and more these days is uh, a Creative Commons zero, CC zero license has been made by the Creative Commons organization, which is a great organization, you should take a look at them around um, licensing content, especially non-source content. But the CC0 license is a open source license that has been designed to really act like the public domain. Basically say there's, there's no permissions or obligations required to use this content code, whatever it may be. So pay attention to that. And it's also a great license if you're ever looking for um, images or sounds for talks. Uh, it's a great, 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 uh, great license to uh, look for content. So when don't we know enough? So we just were talking about the Creative Commons uh, on the last slide. Creative Commons is a family of licenses. It's not a single license. So if somebody says this is licensed under the Creative Commons, you don't know enough. Because the Creative, license, the Creative Commons licenses range from CC0, which is very similar to the public domain, no copyright, no licenses, no obligations, all the way to Creative Commons share alike, which is a strong copyleft license. You don't know what just CC Creative Commons license means without that extra content. So if you see that it's Creative Commons licensed, you need to click and go a little deeper to find out what, what part of the family is it truly there. Um, the code is on GitHub. I got the code from GitHub. That, that doesn't mean you have just permission to download it and use it. Uh, more and more code on GitHub does have good licensing. Uh, they, they try to enforce a uh, kind of when you create a project, with a pick a license feature of GitHub and other, other code repositories like that. But still, I can put code on GitHub and not explicitly pick a license or put a license file there. And especially old content there does not have licensing. So just because it's available, you downloaded it from the internet, you got it on, on GitHub, doesn't mean that it has a license or your permissions. Another 
kind of creaky corner for people is when they get code from their suppliers or they get it from as part of an SDK, software development kit. You, know, you buy a piece of hardware or you're working in a certain ecosystem and you get a, an SDK, a code package from them. Well, is it open source? Is it commercial? Do you have to pay for it? These are all good questions to ask. And, and very often, especially if you're working in like the IoT space or automotive space, you're gonna get an SDK that is part commercial, part open source and part very open source containing strong copyleft license, Linux code, GPL code, et cetera. So you're gonna end up with a stew of licensing and you really need to understand what the licenses are. So if you're dealing with hardware at all, um, pay very lot, a lot of attention to licensing, especially the GPL licensing there. And if you're in certain industries like automotive, um, aerospace, um, anything dealing with IoT or hardware, you're probably gonna find yourself on more on the uh, copyleft um, side of the world. And then you, some people say, we bought a license. Well, maybe they bought a license 15 years ago. Do they still have a license to the, to the current version? What about bug, bug fixes, et cetera? So when you go through your, go through your bill of materials, the list of libraries you're using, all good questions to ask around open source, around things that are not open source, things around commercial. You want to know what the current state of your licensing is, whether it's commercial, open source, or in between. So how have things changed over the years? So uh, if you went back in time to 2000, 2004, um, everybody was using what was called the LAMP stack. So Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, maybe you had a couple dozen software components. Move to 2010, you know, move to platform as a service, maybe move to Amazon, Azure, or Google. You might be using 500 libraries, 500 components. Now in 2020, people are using the mean stack. Um, microservices, all this JavaScript, MongoDB, other databases behind the scenes. Um, you might have 5,000 software components. Um, if you're in automotive, maybe even more than that. That is a lot of stuff to keep track of. Um, if, the, if those were bolts and nuts and, and widgets, you couldn't even, you know, you, you'd have trouble figuring out what you're using. Software is even harder to manage. It's hidden behind the scenes. It doesn't always scream out ownership or licensing. So we have a lot of work ahead of us here. And how did we get, how did we go from a couple dozen components to thousands and thousands of components? One of the biggest changes was the use of repository managers. So if, you, if you're on a development team or you're managing a development team, almost certainly they're using something like Maven, NPM, PIP, Artifactory. There's a million of these things. Uh, especially each ecosystem has a different one. So you may be using multiple ones of these. This is where the developer says, I want to use this library. I want to use this component. Please go download it for me at build time. And oh, by the way, download all of its dependencies and the things it needs to work automatically. So you might have pulled in one library and 20, 50, 100 come along that you never even knew their name. You never even knew the licensing. You, you hope that the licensing is fine. You hope that everything else is great, but it isn't always. So repository managers definitely have added another zero, if not two zeros, to the number of libraries that we have to manage. And then there's the classic ways that people download code. You're going to find that even if you're using a repository manager, people are going to go out and directly download some sort of source archive from the web with a GitHub, GitLab, a project site. They might be using a magic shell script. They download something and they're using a make file or CMake or something like that. And next thing you know, it's going out and doing a bunch of uh, wget or curl statements and it's downloading a whole bunch of source code that you never even knew about. Things to watch. Um, earlier in the previous session, we had a question about cutting and pasting of snippets. Um, very, very common. Uh, it's difficult to manage. We have a couple slides about that in a little bit. Um, copied from a paste bin or a gist. This is uh, very common where you have projects that are not complicated enough to be a, a open source project, but they're useful. Very often you're going to find them on, on something called a paste bin or a Google uh, 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 out on the web search or on a GitHub gist, which is just a single page with a bunch of code on it. These all require licenses as well. And they're very often something that is um, kind of not treated as open source, even though it is. You may find that your um, JavaScript is downloading things from a CDN, a content delivery network. Maybe it never even shows up on your hard drive, but your, your users see it when your developers push this code out to the internet. 
So something to pay attention to. A lot of the stuff on the CDNs are going to be under an MIT license, but for security and just licensing, you should know what's coming out there. Um, bundled with other open source projects. This is where a lot of code comes in that people just don't know how to manage. You, you, you bring in a library and it brings in a hundred other things, or you purchase a live something from a commercial entity and it has a whole bunch of open source in it. This is some of the toughest stuff to manage, both from a licensing and a security perspective. And again, we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that later. Infrastructure. What are you, where's your operating systems coming from? Where are your databases running? What did you pick for your queues and et cetera? Um, these are questions asked your developers, not just what libraries they're selecting, but what infrastructure pieces are they, they grabbing? And then your vendors and suppliers, they're a big part of what you end up using. And all of this wrapped together, if you take all those things that were on the previous slide, we call this the software supply chain. And so it's very similar to a physical supply chain. So if you're building a car and you look at your engine, you break the engine down into parts and modules. And that module, the starter, might get, come from one company. And that starter might have wire from another company and uh, grommets from another company and lug nuts from another company and, and metal housings from another company and so on and so on and so on and track it back like a family tree, five levels, 10 levels or more. Uh, you may have hundreds of suppliers for your project, for your company. You may have thousands if you're building um, software that goes into like an IoT device or an automotive um, display. And layers and layers of complexity and layers of suppliers. This is very difficult to manage. And I think our industry is struggling with this right now. We see a lot of um, software to help manage this, but even still, it's, it's difficult to manage. And again, as we talked about, it's a mixture of open source, commercial, and free. There's software components, there's tool chains, there's documentation, there's utilities. All this gets mixed together and it's a, it's a mess. It's just a mess. And you very often don't have any access or contact with your suppliers. You might not know their names or you might know their name, but they don't answer your email. You don't even have a phone, phone number for them. And you might not even know who they are. I can't tell you how many people depend on code that they didn't know they were using, don't know where it came from. And they, the person doesn't even have a name, doesn't even have an email address. It just has like a, a pseudonym in the source code and it's running on millions of devices. So the, it's a, definitely a journey of a million steps, but you do have to get it started to figure out what code you're using and where it comes from. So let's talk about how you manage that. So you know you have now dozens, hundreds, thousands of components being used. Um, you know your developers didn't do a great job pulling all together. So you need to clean it up. You also need to stem the bleeding, keep problems from continuing to happen. And one of the big ways of doing that is making what's called an open source license policy. And what this says is for all these different licenses, we talked about a bunch of them today, you're going to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down for each use case. So if we're building a product and we're going to distribute a binary to our customer, we're going to allow these licenses and we're going to not allow these other licenses. So you're going to have a, a, a approved list and a rejected list. It may depend on your distribution model. So you might allow a compiler in with a very strong copy left license. But since it's not being shipped to your customers, you're going to allow it. But you wouldn't allow that same license to be attached to some library that gets shipped to your customers. So you're going to go through your models. You're going to go through the licenses. You're going to have a bunch of licenses that you love, a bunch of licenses that you hate, a bunch of licenses that you don't even know about until you start reviewing what your developers are using. So set a policy. Spend a little bit of time figuring out what your model is. Thumbs up, thumbs down. It's a great place to bring your, your lawyers involved. But you need to update it. So you're going to put it out to your developers. You're going to find out all sorts of things about what your developers are actually using. You're going to look at all the libraries that you're using. We call that your bill of materials. And you're going to find licenses that you never even knew you had. You're going to sit down with your lawyer and you're going to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And if something gets a thumbs down, you might have to rip it out. We call that remediation or fixing. And it's very expensive to fix code after the fact. So as we all know, bugs, Bugs are cheap to fix in development. They're hard to fix when they've gone out to customers. And especially open source license bugs are extremely difficult to fix at a later point. So you're going you're gonna to find yourself spending a lot of money to fix something after the fact. Um, great example, go out to opensource.google and look at their docs for their third party licenses. They give a great example of their policy for their use of open source licenses in their products there. So it's a really good thing to look at. I'm a big fan of looking at what other large companies are doing 
because they had they spend millions of dollars on lawyers and policies and agreements and they've learned hard lessons and so if you see what google microsoft adobe others are doing around licensing and policies it might not work for you but it at least gives you a good good understanding about how large companies are managing this so let's again let's again look at what is Google doing around compliance? So in our first session, we talked about notices and how to pass on notices. There's a great example of probably on the very machine that you're watching this on right now of open source compliance notices. So if you have a copy of Google Chrome, it will probably be very similar to other web browsers that you're using, and you open up the About box, you're going to see um, in the About box a link says, okay, Google Chrome, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. Google Chrome is made possible by the Chromium open source project and other open source software. So that blue link there um, is very exciting. We wanna click on that blue link and see what other open source software Google is gonna be giving credit to when they build Google Chrome. So if you go to your about box, click on that and click on your blue link and you will see page after page after page of open source library names in the uh, Chrome credits page, starting with Absel and going all the way to Zilla, our favorite, favorite library there. And each of these gets called out. In this case, just name, you don't see the version. Some organizations will actually put the version number there as well, but these are the name of all these libraries that Google Chrome uses. There's a link to show the license and then a, a, a link to show the homepage, which is a nice thing. It's not required under a lot of the licenses, but it gives credit where credit's due. And it also helps draw people's attention to these libraries, maybe give them a little um, extra support and visibility. Uh, if, if, you're, if the libraries you depend on are get, getting a lot of visibility in the open source world and the commercial world and getting a lot of support, it's best for you. It's better for you. You're, you're, you don't have to spend a, more time working on the open source level. You can spend more time working on your commercial code or in your project code. So you see that that's the list of names, license links, and homepage links. And if we pick on one, Zlib, for example, we will see the actual license text. This is a Zlib license. It tells us version 1.2.11 from 2017. That's the latest and greatest version of Zlib. And this is the, the Zlib license. You see the copyright statement, just like in the BSD license we saw before. In this case here, there's kind of this as is, um, you know, no warranty disclaimer at the top instead of the bottom. And then a, a three clause list of obligations and permissions. Very common to see. And this is a great example of providing notices to your end users. I'm a big, big fan of this, giving credit where credit's due. Most companies do a horrible job of, of showing their notices and attribution requirements. So uh, if you can do this from the beginning, you're ahead of everybody. So we've talked about licenses. We've talked about uh, kind of compliance and, and, and doing the right thing and setting policies. But licensing is only half the, the question. Uh, all software has bugs. Open source software, is it better? Is it worse? You know, people, people are going to say, Open source is better because it has more eyes on it. Some people are going to say open source is worse because there's more ability to go look at it and it's everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm kind of neutral on that. But there is a, 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 a concern around security around all software. And what's great about open source is there are great lists of known vulnerabilities, known bugs that exist in the open source libraries. So if you go to this great site called cve.mitre.org, this is going to give you a list of uh, public vulnerabilities. Um, they're all going to be given a name or a number, CVE 2020-001, and so on and so on. And you can then discuss the vulnerabilities using that common naming scheme and understand what the problems are, what, you know, how to fix it in some case. And it's basically a red alert if you see these starting to appear uh, in the software libraries that you're using. Many other library defects don't get this level of visibility. You only get a CVE in certain cases. If you go to the project homepage, you may find tons of vulnerabilities that are never named, never given a, a cute logo or anything like that. Um, and they're really hard to identify. They're harder for code and scanners to automatically find. So for all the libraries you're using, you wanna pay attention to vulnerabilities. You wanna see if they're showing up on the vulnerability lists. And you're gonna be wanting to be looking um, in their own bug trackers to see 
kind of the ebb and flow of security issues. There. there are some very famous vulnerabilities that are out there. Uh, in the industry, Heartbleed and Struts are two open source libraries that the everybody loves, everybody uses, but it had some very significant vulnerabilities that kind of affected the whole world. So back in 2014, Heartbeat, Heartbleed, which affected the Heartbeat feature of OpenSSL, which is an encryption library, um, basically allowed arbitrary code to be run pretty much anywhere you wanted. And this was very serious. This, this led to many vulnerabilities, it led to um, lots of remediation and fixing. And we still find cases of that, the broken version of that library still hanging out there because it's hard to update, it's hard to find. Struts is a, another great library, comes from Apache, used by tons of projects. 2017, a vulnerability was found. And if you all remember the Equifax breach, they basically were using Struts as part of their web app and were attacked by outside hackers and basically had all their data stolen through the use of this vulnerable component. There was really nothing wrong with struts compared to other libraries. It's just that it had a vulnerability that had a very serious problem that, that people were able to attack. So when we pay attention to these libraries and these vulnerabilities, we want to make sure that we know what the ebb and flow of vulnerabilities are. And as we design our products, it's always good to understand how we're using open source and are, are we able to kind of firewall, firewall off features or data uh, if we suddenly have a vulnerability. So let's talk about how we fix. Um, one of the big dangers of open source vulnerabilities is that they can be scripted. So I might not just be targeting your company, I might be targeting all companies and I might just crawl the internet trying to exercise a defect. Let's see if company A has a struts problem, company B has a struts problem and so on and so on. And when they find a way in, they get in. They can let scripts do this automatically overnight over the weekend. So you, because open source is ubiquitous and everywhere, it's a very common target for attackers. It doesn't have to be your company particularly under attack, but if you're found, they'll take advantage of it. Um, someone in the industry once said, components, open source components age like milk, not like wine. Uh, and I love that phrase uh, because what it means is like as open source, as all libraries get older, they kind of age out. New attacks are found, bugs are found, and people are able to attack them. So kind of you want to keep things current as best you can and just kind of pay attention. Um, one of the best ways to upgrade and fix is you just upgrade. You, you upgrade to the latest safe release. And that may be great for fixing the vulnerability. It may lead to problems with license changes or compatibility with APIs, um, or brings in, in unwanted features or memory bloat. If you're an IoT device, it may require more disk space or memory by upgrading. These all may be problems, un, un, unintended side effects of upgrading. You may need to learn how to block attacks before you can upgrade, put in firewall rules or, or layers um, between the outside world and your product. And you need to have a plan. The, the worst time to figure out how to uh, fix these things is when there's a red alert. Try to do this day to day, build it into your, your culture of staying on top of things and, and validating these upgrades and vulnerabilities. Uh, another big change has been the customer visibility of these vulnerabilities, of the visibility. So customers are now running scanners or their security teams are looking at your products and they're saying, great, um, we'd love to buy your product, we'd love to use your product. You know what, we're gonna run it through our dynamic application security testing product, our DAST product, or our software composition analysis product, which is used to discover open source components and the vulnerabilities. We have our human team, we're gonna look at it. Let's go figure out what's going on. They're gonna find a bunch of problems. It's just the, the very nature. If you're a small company, you go give your code or your product to a big company. They have a lot of experience in finding problems. And through the use of DAST and SCA and human teams, they're going to find a, a laundry list of things to fix, especially if it's the first time that you've had your product go through one of these, these scans. Um, they will expect you to fix the most egregious issues. They're going to want to hear a timetable, a plan. They might not let things go live until you fix these things. They might not let it go live at all. They're going to have two, two different companies and they say company A either had no problems or fixed their problems. So we're going to go with them even if they're more expensive. We can't afford to have big bugs running in our product. 
um, they'll make open source disclosures part of the contract. So even before you sell your license to somebody, they're going to say, give us a disclosure list. Give us your list of open source dependencies. And red flags are going to make them walk away. If you can't give a disclosure list or if it's really old or it's got just you know, licenses that shouldn't be there, they're going to say, this is, this is a, we don't want to buy a bad problem. So pay attention to this. This is something if you are selling software in 2020, the expectation is that large companies, public companies are going to run you through this process um, before they let you go live. So you've heard me use the term remediation a lot. That's, that's basically a $500 word for fixing. Uh, so remediation is a word that you hear for the open source licensing world, the security world, comes up over and over again. It's always better to build an open source management in new products. So if you're starting something today, brand new product at your company, bring in software composition analysis, bring in open source policy right from the very beginning. Don't let an open source library come in without running it through a process. Uh, if you can make something clean from the very beginning, it is so much easier to build and just produce and pass all those tests. If you have an, a, a mature product, something that has been around for years or decades, it can be very difficult and very expensive to fix, but so is doing nothing. You know, if you have a version of struts sitting in your product and you don't know it's there, that can be very expensive for you to, to ignore. Um, legal concerns sometimes get in the way of the technical analysis. So sometimes the legal team is going to say, we don't want to look at that project. It's been fine. Nobody's, nobody's complaining. We don't want to look. Uh, you know, that there's pluses and minuses to that. I'm, I'm usually a big fan of trying to understand what your problems are. You, you want to you want to know what your known problems are and not just have them come out of left field. Those are company killing events. Those are very expensive. Oddball licenses lead to very large legal bills. So if you can stay away from those weird licenses, you're going to not have to deal with the legal analysis, both on your side or on the other side of the table. GPL violations, cases where you're using strong copyleft code where you shouldn't be, can be very expensive to fix. The code that's under the GPL license is typically awesome code and does a lot and to rip it out means you may have to rewrite a huge project or go find something that provides that same functionality. It's very difficult to do. Commercial violations as well can be very, very expensive to fix. So if you take somebody's database and you haven't paid for it and you've shipped it all around the world on embedded devices, you may find yourself with an extremely large bill. So it's better to not ship other people's code in places that you can't afford. And your suppliers don't have to respect your timetable. So you might be using somebody's commercial code that has an open source problem in it, vulnerability in it, and you say, oh, we can't close the big deal that we want to because your code, which we purchased from you, has a problem. Uh, they might not be able to fix it in time, or they won't, won't answer it, or maybe they're not around anymore. So you should be doing this same process with all your commercial suppliers and try it ahead of time make sure that they have their act together and that you have a good communication channel with them so that if it becomes a problem, you know how to talk with them and get your things fixed. So let's talk a little bit more about working with suppliers. Um, try to select vendors who can provide a current bill of materials. If they can't give you a current bill of materials instantly, you know, today, tomorrow, uh, they're probably not a supplier who could do that in an emergency. You want somebody who can give you that bill of materials, that bomb right away. There's a, a new organization and certification called Open Chain. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But it's basically a way of managing open source in your organization. It's a really great thing to be uh, and shows that you're doing the right things internally about managing open source. Try to have a service level ag agreement, an SLA, for security fixes, IP fixes, alerts. You don't want to find out from your own customers that you have a bug from something that came from your supplier. And you maybe want to make this a contract term. Whenever contracts are up for a sale, that's your best time. You know, if you're buying somebody else's software, probably want to negotiate with you. If they want that sale, the other size salespeople are your best partner to get things changed if you can. Do validation tests on code from vendors using SCA and DAST tools when possible. But do remember the buck stops with you. If you sell or running software, your customer's gonna look at you. They're not gonna listen. When you say, oh, it's not our fault, it's our supplier gave us this bug or gave us this IP issue, intellectual property issue, license issue. They don't care. They just know that they can't use their product or all their information was stolen or their financial um, world was impacted. So you are responsible and remember that. So how do we get compliant? How do we, how do we 
how do we make our companies good at this? Well, first thing is you wanna build a team of open source experts. It is great to have everybody educated here, but you, again, the buck needs to stop with somebody. If there's not a couple of people in your company who are responsible for this, it's not gonna get done. You always wanna have a bill of materials, a bomb uh, available for all of your products. If you can generate SPDX reports, there's a, there's a special format for sharing open source licensing information, that's great. You might have your own um, format you use as well. Educate everybody who touches the code, not just developers, uh, technical writers, managers, et cetera. The Linux Foundation and the um, OpenChain have great IP and licensing courses that you can take. Uh, the, the, there's other sessions here at All Things Open that have great licensing courses that I highly recommend everybody in your development team look at. And then if you can, become OpenChain conformant. It is a great checklist and um, education process for getting your act together on an open source. So let's talk about best practices. So software developers do not know licensing. They just don't. It'd be great if they did. You might be lucky and have one or two people, but you need to, you need to start from the very beginning and you need to mandate it. You need to make sure it happens. And not just when you hire them every year, if you can. Open source policies are missing and neglected and impossible to find. You, you wanna fix that. Um, legal could be scared. They might be great with contract law, HR law, employment law, but just are not open source experts. There is a great list of open source um, lawyers around the world that can help you with this. Um, and the cost of fix goes up with every layer built on a mistake. So fix things as soon as they can. And you are gonna find these problems at sales time. You're gonna get a call on Friday at the end of the quarter when your sales team says, we would have made this million dollar deal, but we don't have a bill of materials, or they found a GPL problem, or they found a vulnerability and engineering can't fix it. They, those destroy roadmaps and deals. So you wanna control your destiny. So get ahead of it and don't let sales or customer issues impact your plans. And there is no excuse. There's great free training out there. Here's a great URL for basics for software developers. Uh, it can take an hour and everybody is smarter than they were yesterday by taking that training. Um, three ways that typically you're gonna see remediation happen rewind, replace, or resolve. So rewind means we, res we removed a feature, we got rid of the code. Goodbye IP problem, but also goodbye feature. Um, that can be a pain, that kills your roadmap. You could replace it. So either you clean room the code or you, you swap it out for a workalike library that resolves an IP issue or a, a vulnerability. That takes time, but it's, it's possible. Or you resolve. Sometimes you can pay money to fix the issue. You can, you, you can request new licensing in some rare, rare cases. Usually that does not work. Um, maybe find some commercial, commercial code that you can, you can swap in. But those are typically the three ways to fix an issue. All of them take time and all of them um, have their own costs. You'll sometimes hear people talk about, oh, we're gonna make a shim layer. We're gonna fix our GPL problem by putting in a shim layer. That is usually a, a really serious case and you need to have your legal staff sitting there and really understanding what you're trying to do. Usually that's a way of spending more money. <laughs> Building a shim spend, costs more time, more money and leaves you with a very similar problem in the end. So here be dragons. You really need to understand if you're trying to do that. So you wanna, you know, if you're building a product, if you're building a company, you very often wanna get bought um, or maybe you're buying companies. So open source often comes up in the context of mergers and acquisitions. If you're buying a company, you wanna make sure you're buying something that you own the rights to after you spend a lot of money. You're gonna spend millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars, you don't wanna be burned. If you're selling your company, you wanna sell it for the most amount of money and you don't wanna to have to fix things or, or have them hold back a bunch of money for risk. So you should be prepared if you're selling a company to be able to provide your open source bill of materials, your disclosures. Um, the sell side may need to provide the source code to the whole application to an independent third party. There's some great companies that are out there that'll do this for money. They'll, they'll do these reviews and build a build of materials. The buy side is gonna look at this list that comes out. They won't have access to the source code, but they'll have an access to the disclosures and list of open source. And they can come back and say, you gotta fix this and that and this and that. And they may hold back money or they may walk away from the deal. And I've seen, I've seen both cases. Um, and typically you only got about two weeks uh, between being asked to do this and getting your first report. 
then maybe a few more weeks for fixing the problems if you're the if you're the sell side. So do be prepared for that. And again, another great reason to get things um, clean before you even get there. If you're releasing something under an open source license, uh, everything's going to be visible. You're going to want to make sure that you've probably removed all the commercial code. You're going to look at all the multimedia images and fonts and sounds. Make sure you have permission to do that, permission to use them. That's true for commercial code as well. Make sure that your licenses are compatible and in compliance. And this may be a case where you need to do a very deep dive. There was a question in the previous session about source code snippets. If you're releasing something on an open source license, all your code's going to be visible. You want to make sure that you're giving the right credit to the code. You want to generate your license notices. And you may want to look and decide on a contributor licensing agreement for any code that comes back in, a developer certificate of origin, and or a code of conduct. These are all super important if you're going to be making an open source project yourself. Open source scanning. So these are companies and products and open source projects that scan through your code and helps you figure out what you're using. And you may be using hundreds or thousands of components. That's way outside the ability of humans to, to deal with. Uh, there's a great number in, in um, sociology called Dunbar's number, which maybe means that the human brain can maybe keep track of like 150 relationships. We now have 500 or 5,000 components, way, way too many to manage um, just by a human. So software composition analysis, SCA, this is the scanning tools that are used to manage it. It allows you to automate the discovery, allows you to set license policies, vulnerability policies, generate your BOM reports, and also can alert if there's either IP problems or license policy problems. Great tools to run. Um, they have some setup time and costs, even if you're using a free tool, but they're, they're great to, to start using. Um, on the left hand side, I have a list of free tools that are either software composition analysis tools or systems that are associated with that. Great ways to get started. Um, OWASP makes dependency check. There's also scan code that are out there. These are great tools to kind of find out both for your license, some of your licensing issues and your um, um, vulnerabilities. On the right hand side is commercial code uh, SEA systems. Uh, Many, many that are out there now. Great ways to get support as well. Uh, not, just, not just a toolkit, but training and support. And I highly recommend that you, you, run, you run at least one of these. You maybe find yourself running multiple ones of these to make sure your code is, gets clean and stay clean. So how does, how does SCA find third-party code? Well, it's going to do things such as look at your repository artifacts, like your Maven files, your NPM files, things like that may look for license text itself, might look for the word general public license, might look for copyright statements, might look for stolen files, might look for cutting, cut and pasted code. These are all things that require a human to, to manage. The things at the top are a little easier for a human to manage. Usually it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down because they're big pieces, big rocks. The things at the bottom like stolen source code or cut and pasted source code can be difficult to manage and really requires an expert eye. That might be a case where you have uh, outside staff help you. Um, snippets are tough. Um, they are becoming more and more important as time goes on. S fingerprinting snippets is where you want to see, did your developers take code from some other open source project and insert it right in the middle of yours without preserving the license text? It's cut the pasted code. Sometimes it's involved with license laundering. Somebody took some code under the GPL license and brought it in under a different license. You want to be able to find that and manage that, especially uh, if you are going to be acquired by certain large companies or if you're going to be releasing this code as open source. They can be difficult to understand. It's a lot of work. There's uh, concerns around false positives, though, frankly, I think when people say false positives, sometimes there's an excuse not to do the real analysis. You find a lot of problems. You want to deal with it. So um, not everybody's ready to start there, but I do think you should be paying attention to this, especially in certain fields of use. Um, you are probably going to be running SAST or DAST tools on your code. This is ways of finding new vulnerabilities. It's something above and beyond software composition analysis. So it finds new bugs, not just known bugs. And usually you're going to find that you're going to be running these tools on your proprietary code, not on the open source side. This is sometimes too difficult to do. 
Uh, one of the last things we'll, we'll talk about here is open chain. This is a slide from the open chain project. I highly recommend anybody building software, whether it's open source projects or commercial software, that they become open chain conformant. It is now an ISO standard. It's pretty straightforward to get involved with. They have a great list of education and checklists and processes, and you can self certify. You, you follow the checklist and you can basically say, yes, we are open chain conformant, or you can bring in a third party to, to make sure that you're conformant. Um, go to the open chain project, great set of experts there as well. There's a few monthly meetings that you can join, great documentation, great, great um, code that is available and tools as well. Highly, highly recommended. Be, everybody becomes Excuse me. Yes. Excuse me, Jeff, just giving you a heads up that you have five minutes left. Thanks so much. Okay, we're getting toward the end here. And we'll leave a little bit of time for questions here at the end. Um, here is a set of best practices. This will be available uh, as a checklist in the uh, slides afterward, basically reviewing what I've talked about today. And they are all great places to improve the quality of your, your product and your company. Um, they all don't have to be done at once, but you should pick some of the things, especially software composition analysis at the top, to start getting your house in order. So a couple things I learned along the way, compliance and open source is still very personality driven. You're gonna find that you might have one or two experts who care about this in a company. It might be you, if you're the person on the call today here. Uh, when influencers leave, a company's compliance program often falls apart. You wanna try through things like open chain and whatnot to make it more part of um, the soul of your company. You're gonna find that experience levels very greatly. Some companies are great at this, some are bad at this. Um, remediation is difficult and is more of an art than a science, um, and you learn by doing it along the way. And what is, what's difficult? Well, new code is valued over maintenance, so nobody wants to go back in time and fix things, uh, especially for compliance outside of M&A work. Um, you're going to have to fight that struggle. Um, Inner package licensing is still difficult. What happens underneath the libraries that you bring in from the outside? Most people only know 1% of what they're actually using. That's a problem. And each layer is managed by different teams and they might be um, difficult to work with. And there are some things that people just never ever wanna deal with, like old code. So we'll talk about what's on the horizon. Um, you need to use a tool. You need to be concerned about supply chain attacks. I think this is something that we're gonna see over the next few years here, how companies are gonna be attacked by people attacking their supply chain libraries and tools. Um, get, get the bill of materials as part of your contracts. Um, you're gonna probably wanna start working with internal audit because they're gonna to come to you at a certain point and say, we need to manage open source. And if you're dealing with databases, there's a lot of new licenses or quasi FOSS licenses that are gonna affect how you use databases and pay for. So we got a couple minutes here for Q&A. I saw out of the corner of my eye a million questions here. Let's see if we can um, work through as many of these as we can. So let's take a look. Any guidance on how to handle the point if a supplier doesn't want to answer the questions regarding open source in the commercial delivered um, software, so Siegfried? Um, you have a lot of pressure. If, if the supplier um, is not answering these questions, you're probably paying them. So when the contract comes up for, for review, start making noise about looking at other suppliers. Um, start, um, I've seen companies sometimes find one or two or three serious problems to start the question, to start the conversation. Hey, we found a GPL problem. Hey, we found um, heart bleed in your code that you gave us and you haven't updated it. Sometimes finding one of the two or three of those issues, especially if you bring in the other side's legal team in, can help open that dam. Um, usually it's not because they don't wanna help you, it's that they're scared, and they're worried that they're gonna find a bunch of problems. And um, it's a conversation and we all need to get better. And so uh, work with your suppliers, try to see what you can do. And if you need to, you need to walk away, find another supplier. Okay, um, will, the great slide, will the slides be shared? Yes, they will be shared and um, Scanning questions, is scanning mean both snippets and or dependencies? Scanning can be um, snippets, can be dependencies, can be um, multimedia images, icons. It depends on the tool that you select. And different tools will have different types of things that they can discover. 
um, there was a great paper that was released today talking about comparisons of scanning tools that um, if you if you look uh, for uh, SEA scanning tools paper released today, um, you'll see some good information there. Let's see. Projects with hundreds or thousands of dependency, dependencies inevitably have dependencies with incompatible licenses. What is your best practice recommendation for consumers of third party source code to handle this? Um, this is tough, and I think this is why sometimes there is paralysis around licensing and, and answering these questions. Um, because you're going to find problems, people sometimes don't want to look for it. If you can, this might be a place where you start doing open source contributions yourself. If you find this problem and it matters to your company, this might be a case where you have your own developers start to fix and remediate those issues. Maybe you log them as defects if you can't fix them yourself. This might be a case where you need to start moving away. Um, it is tough. And I think we, we it, it took us 30 years to get to this point of this kind of mess of combinations of com uh, libraries and components and licenses. It's probably going to take us years to dig out of it, but we need to start doing the work to dig out of it. If you can start with smaller projects, that's great. But sometimes you find that you just got to make a stink and to say, this is a problem. We shouldn't be making new features if we have a big GPL violation or, or X, Y, Z. And you do see that companies do, you know, do slowly, slowly start to get their acts together. And this may be a case, again, a little financial help, a little legal help, et cetera. Um, so tools to track software acquisition. Um, if I can go back in time here a little bit, um, there is a slide that has a list of some tools. I missed a couple just because it's a very fast moving space, but um, these are tools that are great for scanning. Some just scan for licensed text. Others actually scan for the dependencies themselves. Others are backed by um, actual databases of snippets. So like uh, Palomita, which I started back in 2004, now owned by a company called Revenera. They can do snippet analysis, I believe. Uh, FOSS ID and maybe Synopsys may be able to do snippet analysis. Great question to ask um, your vendor. And you may start with things that are just doing package level analysis and then eventually move to snippet level analysis as, as your ability to deal um, gets, gets better. Uh, let's see. Um, any other questions? I believe we have hit all the questions there and we're kind of hitting toward the end of time here. Anything I missed or any last questions that people have? Okay, if you have any after the session today, please feel free to follow up with me at Jeff Lush on Twitter or on my website. I love answering questions or helping out the best I can on this. Um, I post uh, talks and, and, and my writing on zebracatzebra.com. Please, uh, please feel free to join um, there and watch and ask any questions. Like I said, love to, love to answer anything. And I really appreciate everybody's time today.